I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast unto the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt. That's cute, but I said, oh, magnify the Lord. I didn't say magnify the weekend. It's not about pastor appreciation right now. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt God's name together. I don't know what your Monday was like. Tuesday may have been hard. Wednesday tried to take you out, but it's Sunday morning and we're back in the house of the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. It is always good to be in the house of the Lord at least one more time. And I made a vow to God that every time I go into the house of the Lord, I would praise him like it's my last time because I have enough sense to know it could be. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. I'm grateful to be with you today. I'm grateful that your pastor would trust me enough to be with you today. I won't keep you long. We'll get right to it. I believe there's a word from the Lord today. Uh, it'll come from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. And it reads like this. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said her, to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed and the demon gone. God, we love you and we bless you. We believe in you and we have great expectation of you. I ask God that you would speak to us right now in the name of Jesus. God, go through our lives and the things that we are most concerned with, God. And if you don't give us an answer today, give us peace. If you don't remove it today, God, give us a little more understanding. Your word says you will perfect those things which concern us. So, God, we give it to you, those things that keep us up late at night and wake us early in the morning, hoping that they don't turn out the way we think they may or hoping they don't come out on the front page news. God, we know that you're able and willing to fix us, but to fix our situation. These are your servants' prayers in your son Jesus' name, amen. If we could use the title today, what were you expecting? What were you expecting? I ordered a dress and I needed it to arrive on time. I was gonna be away, so I asked my mother to look out for my dress to come in the mail. I needed this dress to look good, okay? I was on my way to a special gala and I needed to make sure I could take the breath out the room when I walked in. I needed it to hug in the right places. I needed it to give me curves that I really did not have. I needed this dress to come in, and I needed it to be amazing. My mother called me when the dress came in, and she was bragging about it, talking about how beautiful it was, and she couldn't wait until I got home. I get home, and I take the dress out of the box, and as soon as I look at it, my face drops with disappointment. My mother is still smiling with a huge smile on her face, just ready for me to be excited, and she looks at my face and said, what's wrong? And I said, this isn't the dress I ordered. And she said, what were you expecting? If I had given my mother the description of the dress, if I would have told her what I was looking for, if I would have told her what it should have looked like while I was away, she could have swapped the dress and got me what I needed. But because I didn't have, give my mother my expectations, she thought she had what I needed and she, she thought she had what I needed and she didn't. If we're honest, there are times when we've gotten we haven't gotten what we wanted or deserved because we didn't set expectations. We've treated the political process like a weld oil machine that would run on its own and our input and uh, without our input and while others were presenting agendas and making demands, we assumed that Kamala knew what we needed and had our back and we got exactly what we have asked for, nothing. 
We've began relationships after a dry spell. When we were in high demand and we felt like we were high on the Dow Jones, we had a list as long as my grandmama's $100 receipt from the dollar store. But as soon as we found ourselves in a drought, we told ourselves we were being less demanding and controlling. But the truth was, we found ourselves in a drought for so long that we suspended our expectations and we got everything we required, nothing. Ladies, we go to the salon and you know, we have big dreams and no real expectations. We tell the stylist, make me look pretty or make me look sexy for my spouse. And when they turn us around to the mirror, we're disappointed. She don't know what you think is pretty and she don't know what your spouse thinks is sexy. She did the best she could and you got exactly what you asked for. And because I'm equal opportunity men, you go to the gym, start picking up the heaviest equipment, not knowing exactly what you want. So you look at the person next to you. If it worked for them, it works for you. Three months later, you find yourself without your desired goal because you got exactly what you planned for and expected. Not much. We go to school with no expectations. We start fast at the beginning of each year with few expectations. We even go to church on Sunday with little expectation. We say things like, I want a bomb worship. I want a good word. I want nice fellowship. We've never determined what a good word was. We never had expectations of signs and wonders, and we don't even come with prayer points that we can lift up if somebody asks us what we need. And as soon as we're feeling down, we say stuff like, I ain't feeling that no more. I'm not being fed. I got to find some place where God is moving. Well, the truth is God is moving and feeding and performing miracles for those who have asked with expectation. We've all had low expectations of God at some point. We begin to shrink our prayers because God doesn't answer a few prayers or because God has seemingly grossly mishandled our family, neglected our romantic relationships, and fumbled when we thought God was working in our finances. Disappointment with God will reduce us to a dismal faith. This story is a familiar one. It becomes popular because of Jesus' response. Many were expecting the Jesus from the woman with the issue of the blood, of blood or Jesus who feeds the masses or Mary and Martha's Jesus or the Jesus who stops the funeral procession and resurrects the young boy, the Jesus who follows Jairus home to heal his daughter, the Jesus who interrupts his own death to make a promise to a thief. And whether chronologically appropriate or not, we always will remember first sweet baby Jesus that came in clutch. But this time, we have to wrestle with this version of Jesus. Part of what it means to get in the face of Jesus is to know your position. You can't expect getting in the face of Jesus to be easy. Interruptions require courage. You have to be bold to get in the face of Jesus. If that weren't true, we would all have a better prayer life. Jesus was on break like a Target employee with khakis and, and, and red shirt who was going through the aisles like we were. And you know you need something and you can clearly see he's on his break, but you ask anyway and you said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> were you on break? She interrupts arresting Jesus at this point, but she knew what to expect. She knew based on who she was and where she'd come from, she had to beg. She was willing to come and immediately begin to beg because she understood her social standing. She did her intel and called him son of man, and she shouldn't have even known Jesus in that way, but she righteously resisted acquiescing to a social standing because she was insistent upon getting in the face of Jesus. I know where I come from. I know who my people are. I know what I should ask, but in spite of that, I got a sick baby at home, and I'm right here in your face. She got in the face of Jesus, not for favor, because they didn't have relationship. She gets in the faith of, face of Jesus because she has faith in spite of her position. Because favor will get you what you don't deserve. But faith will give you what you cannot discern. What couldn't she discern? The things that people can't figure out about you. How does she get healed without a doctor? How does she, how's she able to make it unemployed? There are things that faith will get you that favor cannot. Favor is from God, but through man. Faith is from God, and it'll produce things straight from God. You have to work for favor, but you got to walk in faith. Two people we know in the Bible were blessed because of favor. Esther won favor from the king, and Joseph gained favor from Pharaoh, but Noah's faith helped him survive the flood, but he had to build when there was no forecast of rain. Daniel's faith led him to the upper chamber to hear from God and to see signs and miracles. Gideon had a small army and large faith, and that was all he needed to win the battle. God even exhibited faith when he called the universe into existence and said, let there be, and there was. A faithful Enoch shimmied into heaven, escaping death, and left nobody to be found because of faith because favor 
will get you some things. But faith is going to get you something from God that can't be taken away. You see, favor will give you stuff, but faith will make you CEO over stuff. Favor will allow you to marry well, but faith will help you to marry wisely. Favor will give you your dream car, but faith will help you to invest in the car stock. Favor will give you a job, but faith will give you a career and allow you to be able to employ other people. In the face of Jesus, Jesus will fix what you cannot face. You, sit in the, you can decide how you're going to ride out. You can sit in the face of a sick daughter, or you can go to a Jesus who can heal her. You can sit in the face of bills, or you can go to the provider who can create financial stability. You, you can sit in a rocky marriage crying and complaining, or you can go back to the one who joined you together in the first place, if, if you did. You, you got to know your position. But if you stand in the place of faith, you have to adjust your posture. A desperate mother is inescapable. She was too desperate to wait. She began begging immediately because she knew what she was up against. And you got to be a bold mother, and I do mean mother, to be willing to interrupt arresting Jesus. Jesus in this text was not operating as the baby born in a little old manger or the Jewish man in Roman occupied territory. This time he's acting like a man who has greater social standing, more clout, greater number of social media followers. And Jesus in this moment was a big fish in a small pond. And that's how he acted. But she was too desperate to care. He said, let the children be fed first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And I appreciate her in this moment because she said, a dog? Okay, I'll be that. Because desperation will call you out of caring what other people have to say about you. Because when you want something bad enough, you keep pushing past foolishness that has nothing to do with you anyway. People try to take shots at you, but you don't care because you're on a mission. If you think you're really going through and you still care about what people say, you're not desperate enough. If your child is in legal trouble and you're more worried about what your friends are going to say than the systemic racism of a system who's going to put him away for 20 to 30 when it should be 3 to 5, you're not desperate enough. If you have a teenage daughter who is pregnant and you're more worried about what church people are going to say instead of who convinced her to go from appropriate activity to adult activity, you're not desperate enough. If you have communities of color that are dying and you're more worried about black on black crime, which is actually about proximity instead of food deserts and lack of access to health care and systemically imbalanced education, you haven't been desperate enough because desperate people push past all the foolishness to get what they need. But she was too desperate to quit. Desperation will make you open to some things you don't normally want to be open to. You know, when you got a good job, you got a cute praise. But if you stay unemployed long enough, we're going to see you right here at the altar. If we find you healthy, you don't believe in all that. It don't take all that running around and hollering. But if you get a terminal report, all of a sudden we hear tongues we ain't never heard from you before. You're good when your child is on honor roll. But when they're on opioids, you lay and prostrate at the altar. Because desperation will make you open to things you've never been open to before. Expectation comes from trials or testimonies. She heard that Jesus was coming through providing. It didn't matter what he said to her because she had the experience or the testimony of others that said Jesus could provide. So she decided, I don't care what's happening now. A provider got to provide. I don't care if I'm in need of healing. I don't care if I'm in need of peace. I don't care if I'm in need of employment or fertility. All I knew was that provision was before me. She's not talking about just food here. All she knows is that provision is in the space. Talking about providing food for the children and the hierarchy of receiving provision. But all she hears is you provide. There may be a pecking order, but what I'm clear about now that I was not clear before I saw you, Jesus, is that the rumors are true and you have the ability to provide. She says to him, okay, if it's a dog that I got to be, I'm going to be that. But I think if Jesus is going to call her dog, she had to have some dog sense. So I looked up what it meant to be a dog in this day. Uh, you would be a scavenger. Uh, the, this text says that it was a little dog, but they were scavengers nonetheless. They weren't having house pets. They don't do like we do, Chanel, Dior, Lexus, Mercedes. They're they not doing that. So she has some dog sense. So I looked up what it meant to be a dog. Scavengers are always hungry. And I say that you should always be hungry. Always stay desperate for God. 
scavengers have to fight for what they want, so you gotta come begging and refuse to leave empty-handed. And scavengers roll in packs, so when you go to God, you ought to know that there's a community who's praying with you and for you. But a dog with a home has different expectations than a scavenger. She did not call him what she should have. She said, son of man or Lord. That means she's putting responsibility for her care upon him. That means she's putting herself in relationship with him whether he wants it or not. So a dog with a home assumes a different posture. If you belong to the Savior and you're being kept by the Savior, you ought to have the expectation, expectations of the Savior. So much so that when it seems like your prayer has been rejected, you don't give up on a Savior, but you lean in with your faith. I appreciate the fact that she didn't care about him calling her a dog, but, but a dog with a home has different kind of expectations of their, of their owner. You see, I have a dog, Tanner. Oh, I don't anymore, he died. He died in April, but Tanner got to live with us for five years. I bought Tanner because I was always traveling and I thought my mom needed a companion. So I went to get this dog for my mother I had to travel to go and get him. I had to pay a price for him because Yorkies are expensive. I saved him because he was also in adoption and I took responsibility for him. That meant when he had to go to the doctor, I did pay the $2,000 for him to be well. That means every time he needed food, I was willing to go and buy the best brand so he wouldn't be hungry. That means even if times got tough, I was going to make sure we both had a roof over our head because if I was going to be sheltered, he would be too. Tanner had expectations of his master. He believed that because I was eating, he was going to eat. He believed that as long as I was taking care of myself, he was going to be taken care of. Well, I also know somebody else that is in this text who has a similar story. Jesus came for his daddy. He left and traveled from heaven to come to earth. He paid a price for you and me. He saved us by adopting us into his life. He took responsibility for us. He promises by his stripes we're healed. He promises that if he could take care of the lilies of the valley and the birds of the air who neither reap or sow, then we were going to be okay too. He tells us weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. And if you look back over your life, you will see that God has kept God's promise to you and taken care of you. But there was this little trick. There was this little trick that, that Tanner would do. I, had, I hadn't had a dog since I was a child. And, and, and when he first got there, he, he was a little bougie. You know, he didn't really talk to us. He sat by the cage. We would have to bring the food. If we put the food too far away from him, he wouldn't even go to it like I was his servant. And then when he became more comfortable, I noticed something. If we were in the kitchen and Tanner heard pots and pans moving, he would immediately go from wherever he was and he would go sit under the table. So Tanner would stay under the table. He wouldn't bother anybody. Don't forget, I'm in the kitchen. He's in a dining room under the table because he knows where we're going to be prepared to eat. So he goes under the table, and then we would get the food and bring it to the dining room table, and we would ignore him because there's only going to be two chubby people in my house. It's not going to be me. I mean, only one. It's not going to be me and him. It's going to be me. (laughs) Tanner had an eating schedule, but every time there was food, Tanner wanted what I had. I would go to the table and start eating and and Tanner would be irritated and he would think I didn't see him. So he would go from laying under the table to getting on his hind legs with his hands up because I don't feed dogs and whatever I eat. I don't think he should have. I would ignore Tanner and Tanner decided he couldn't be ignored because he believed that his master would take care of him. And as long as his master was eating, he should eat too. So when I wouldn't pay attention from Tanner, he went from going laying down under the table to standing on his hind legs and if I wouldn't pay attention he would jump and he would jump waiting for me to pay attention to him well if I didn't do that Tanner did not give up he never wanted to make sure he was being too aggressive so he would do this little call and he would say Tanner would do this so that he wouldn't frighten me, but so that I could remember that he was there and had need of me. I guess I just came here and wasted all of your time to say if Tanner could believe that his master would not eat and leave him hungry, you ought to believe that the same master is going to take care of you. I don't know what you're in need of and I don't know what you've been praying about. I don't know what you've been fasting for, but what I do know is provision is in the house. Whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you've come for, Whatever it is that you have expectations of God for, God will do. Because
says if the dogs should get crumbs, you ought to have the whole loaf. So bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me until I want no more. Feed me until you're all I want. Feed me until you're all I need. Feed me until there's no doubt left. Feed me until I know you supply. Feed me until I get healed. Feed me until I get what you promised. Feed me until I don't care about what others say. You've got to believe that the same God who believed that something was left for the children and even left something for the dog ought to owe you something too. So I don't know what you've been in prayer about. I don't know what you've been in need of. I don't know the prayer that you stopped praying because it seemed like God wouldn't come through. But because I know provision is in the house, I ask you right now to stop. Think about what you've given up on. Think about how you tried to shrink God. Think about how upset you've been with him. Think about all the things and all the promises you had that didn't come quickly enough. And think about that thing that you've asked for so much that it seemed like God don't even care to give it to you. And while provision is in that house, I ask you to open up your mouth and pray again. Try God again. Have expectations of God. Treat your master like that's your master. Treat, your, treat, the, treat the God that loves you. Call back to God's word. Remind God of the promises. She went to Jesus. Jesus was tripping that day. But she believed in the character of Jesus. Even when he wasn't displaying it. So go back to prayer. You are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should change your mind, nor a city girl that you might try to trick me. You got to go back to God. This ain't about me and my faithfulness and my fidelity. This is about you, your promises, your character. So whatever it is, I ask you in this moment, we're going to stop and spend some time praying together. Tell God what you need. Provision is in the house. Don't leave out of here empty. Because I pray that whatever it is you've been praying about meets you back at home. I pray that whatever it is that you've been praying about, you have the answer to while you're on your way. There is provision in the house. God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you with great expectation, God. We understand that we have feeble minds compared to the big dreams and visions you have for us. God, some of us just have basic needs that we're asking you to supply. And if you'll take care of the lilies of the valley and the birds of the air who neither reap, sow, praise, or give, I know you're going to take care of us. So make room, God, make provision for all that we need. God, there are some things that you promised long ago and it's taken so long that we don't even know if we should pray about them anymore. We, we don't even know if you changed your mind and decided somebody else was better suited to take care of these things. But God, because you promised it, we are going to wait for it. So do it right now in the name of Jesus because your word is true. God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that while we're praying and while we know provision is in the house, God, we also ask that you provide us with bigger dreams. That you give us a great enough relationship that we know what to expect from you. That we stop shrinking our prayers and shrinking our lives to fit what we can produce. But we trust God that you're able and you're willing to do more. Oh God, we love you. We bless your name. We lift you up because you're worthy to be praised. God, if you never did a thing, it would be okay. But that's not what your word says. Your word says, surely goodness and mercy should follow me all the days of my life. Goodness ain't hunger, God. Goodness means shelter, God. Goodness means a living wage, God. So we stand on your word and we wait for you to produce and we know you're able and if the dogs deserve crumbs disciples deserve the whole loaf in Jesus' name we pray amen